Good morning. We are going to get started here, get rolling in what I think is probably going to be the last on our series of David. We've taken him from boy to king, and sometime in the future we'll take him from king to disaster. But, um, Ms. Wadia, would you open us this morning? Yes, and I would like to say I'm glad we're not going to go to disaster right now. <laughs> <laughs> I second that. Thank you. Heavenly Father, and our, our gracious God, creator of all things, Lord, we stand in awe of you this morning and your great love for us. And how much we need to do that you sacrifice your only son for your creation that remains to this day so thankless for all that you've done. Lord, create a new heart in us, as David asked, and a right spirit. Help us, Lord, to see <coughs> and to embrace and to understand in a better way that love that you have for us, <coughs> that we can take it in and share that love and give that love out to the world around us. Because bitterness and strife and contention won't resolve anything, Lord. What we need is love. So help us, Lord, this day as we study about David the King, the example of a man after your own heart. Help us as we watch the pastor we've had for years come and then leave us for one last time, Lord, knowing, Lord, that his life will be different from this point on, and so will ours. And open our hearts, Lord, to receive the instruction you have for us. Speak to us clearly and firmly, and lead us, Lord, in the way we should go. Help us to accept it and follow in obedience. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I want to say thank you to Steve uh, for taking last week. Thank you. Um, it's always great to know that we have so many godly teachers in this place and that, you know, if one's gone, one can step in and nothing changes. So again, Steve, I just want to say thank you for that. Um, the wedding went off without a hitch, mostly. <laughs> there are, you know, there's never, there's never a wedding that doesn't go off without a hitch. It's just whether or not the audience knows and I don't think the audience really knew. There's always those little funky things here or there. But if you want to see pictures, talk to the proud mom. She's got a phone full of them. Um, and, and she so far has not paused to show anybody, oh, you want to see pictures? <laughs> Including some but random lady at, we were checking out from a store the other day. So. I don't care. I have no pride. <laughs> 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 but I am officially done. Whoa. I'll be shopping anytime you want, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, went, went, off without, went, went off without a hitch, went off well. Um, although I'm, I'm a little upset with my family because they conspired against me. Uh, at the uh, father-daughter dance, they picked a particular song that apparently they talked about ahead of time and said, this will break dad. <laughs> this will make dad cry. And they were right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it worked well. So other than that, it was it was it was a beautiful day and, and a beautiful trip. And so but like I said, I we're we're going to finish off with David here. Um, where we're going next, I'm not hundred percent sure. I've, I've talked to God about it a couple of times and God keeps telling, just be patient, you'll get what you need when you need it. Which, you know, being the control freak that I am, I want to be six months out in my thinking, and, and that just it's, isn't quite that way. So, so let's get let's get in, and, and we're, like I said, this particular, we're, we're basically going to be finishing off the book of 1 Samuel today, uh, which is David's early life. David from boy to king in, in 1 Samuel. So that's where we're going today. But let's kind of take our minds back to a couple of weeks ago with... David's second sparing of Saul and his last contact with Saul. If you remember from two weeks ago, this was the last conversation that 
David and Saul would ever have. The last face-to-face -face meeting, and it was from a distance. Um, Saul's famous spear, all of that was involved in there. Um, but who betrayed David again? The Ziphites. The Ziphites. And they were of the tribe of Judah, the same tribe that David is from. So these are relatives. You remember the first time that Saul came out to the wilderness, it was the Ziphites who ran up to Saul and said, hey, we know where he's at. And here they were busy doing it again. Um, and I, I've, I've looked very carefully because I know what would happen had I become king and the Ziphites were still around. But David becomes king and you don't, if you read the book of Chronicles and 2 Samuel and whatnot, you don't see David going in there and wiping out the, the Ziphites. Um, which is kind of amazing. Because humans being what they are, had they done that to me, and I became, you know, unqualified, unstoppable ruler, the Ziphites and I might, might have been having a second conversation down the road. <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. Human nature, so. Yep. Yeah. Mm -mm. So, what did, and remember, David and Abishai sneak into the camp. What did David assure Abishai that God would do? Because Abishai is there, and there's good, there's speculation that Abishai may have been in the cave with him during that first time when David cuts off a corner of his robe and all that, and David doesn't kill Saul. So this time he said, same, same thing. God has given him into your hands. He gives that same idea that they gave him back in the cave. Hey, God has given Here he is. It's, it's right there. Let me kill him. I, I, I got it that you won't raise your hand again. Let me do it. And boy, I'll take his spear. And there will be no second shot. We'll finish it off. But what does David assure Abishai that God would do? Take care of it in his own time. Yeah, he says, Abishai, God's going to take care of Saul in his time. All right? It's not a problem. He'll kill him in battle. He'll deal with it sometime. But right now, this is still God's anointed. This is God's problem. This is God's man. He will deal with him when he's good and ready. We're not going to do it. Which is a very difficult decision for us, isn't it, sometimes? We say, hey, I can just do it. God, I got this. I'll, I'll take care of it for you. <laughs> it's right here. I mean, why not? And David tells Abishai, we're just going to take his spear and his water jug, and we're leaving. Same thing. This is God's issue. We're not going to take on God's problems. David tells Saul that if he thought that God was leading him to hurt him, that Saul should do what? Pray. Pray and offer sacrifices, which is all in the culture of the time. That was all involved in one aspect. He said, you should smell a sacrifice, i.e., you should be busy seeking God's faith. Because if you think God is sending you out to kill me, you need to think again. and You need, you need to go seek God. Still a good thing to do, is it not? Yes. Um, you should be seeking God's face because that's where you're going to get the wisdom as well. So then David and Saul have... Somebody want to get those girls a couple of chairs? No, no, no. We've, we've, we've got empty chairs all over the place here. I just don't... They're fine where they are. I just didn't want them having to stand and... I mean, they got young legs and all, but still. So there's Abishai. They get back with the spear. They get back with the water jug. David, as you remember, yells out at the camp. Tells Abner, who, by the way, if you, if you again, study scripture very carefully, Abner was one of Saul's cousins. So his top general, and a great warrior in his own right, is related to Saul. Saul's in the middle of that 3,000-man camp, and now David gets on that hill and yells, you should die because you failed to save your king. 
and all of your men should die. You all failed. And he holds up the spear and water jug. Here's why. You messed up. Now Saul gets involved. They start talking. And just like with the cave, Saul kind of repents of what he's done. Very mercurial Saul. He's this way. He's this way. Bipolar. Remember, we've kind of discussed that. Was he? We don't know. There's speculation to that. But we do know that Saul can be manipulated up and down the, the scale. And then finally, his last thing that he tells David. What's the last thing that he tells David? Blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed. The last, the meeting before, he said, hey, when you become king, remember my family, don't wipe them out. Don't do what is typical of all the kings of the area where you wipe out the entire family so there's no bloodline to come back in and say, well, okay, I'm the grandson of Saul. I should be king now. And, please, and David says, no, I'm not going to do that. And now he says, you know what, David, you are blessed. And that's the last meeting between Saul and David. So that's kind of where we left off. Today, now the title is, is The Rescue, and we're going to see David do a rescue. But really what I want to kind of talk about is the concept of applause. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> ah, cheap way to get applause. Yeah. About like the old TV shows where some guy would walk up with a sign saying applause, you know. Um, during the interview with Dr. Ernest Miller, this is Dr. Ernest Miller on, on your left there, um, he was a, a well-known and well-written Presbyterian pastor of the, the 50s, 60s, and end of the 70s. And he said this, recently my wife and I sat charmed at an outdoor performance by young Suzuki violin students. I just picked a generic one. So I, I thought the kid was cute. Yes. <laughs> After the concert, an instructor spoke briefly on how children as young as two, three, and four years old are taught to play violin. A two-year-old playing violin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Of course, one of my kids played the bagpipes, and those early notes are also very interesting. Um, the first thing the children, the instructor tells Dr. Miller that the first thing that they learn is a proper stance, how to stand while holding the violin. That's the first thing. Before you ever pick, so here's how you stand. Here's, he said, then the second thing that we teach them, even before they pick up the violin, before they learn how to hold the bow, my one daughter, and a number of you follow my daughter in Texas, Whitney, the, the colorful daughter, the, the funny as all get out daughter. Um, we had her learning to play violin. Um, she is also bipolar and teaching a bipolar person to play violin is always a challenge, not for me, but for the instructor. And the instructor would get her to hold the bow properly with a couple of fingers and hold here and, the, and she would work with her and she'd get her just set and as she's getting set, ready to draw the first note, Addie would scratch her nose, Addie would scratch her nose. Oh, or Whitney would scratch her nose. <laughs> now we would place her fingers again, get it all ready, and then, and then her ear would, yeah, yeah, so. But he said, the first, before we even get to that point, the next thing that we teach them after the stance is how to take a bow. How to take a bow after they're done. And he said, the instructor said this, if the children just play the violin and stop, people may forget to show their appreciation, the instructor said. But when the children bow, the audience invariably applauds. And applause is the best motivator we've found to make children feel good about performing and want to do it well. Want to do it well. Everyone likes a little applause. Everyone, everyone likes a little, whether it's actually the hand clapping or somebody saying, dude, you did a great job. Man, I can't believe how well you guys smoked that test. You've taken good care, the way you took, you know, did this or that. Everybody likes a little applause, everybody. We are hardwired for it. 
If you haven't been to the movies recently, the credits go on and on and on and on. Everybody gets their name on. I have read them. Just, I'm curious, what could pop? And I mean, we're talking, the guy who drove the bagels to the set has a line in there. It doesn't quite say that, but yeah. Everybody. Now, if you go back and watch a movie, an old movie, an old movie, from the 40s, 50s, even 60s, the credits are pretty short. You get the stars, you get the director, the producers, and maybe a couple of top people like who wrote the mu who directed the music, the and they're done. Yeah, and it's done. The credits are very short compared to a modern day movie. Now, some of that is union stuff, but again, everybody likes applause. And I will tell you that when that movie plays, the guy who drove the bagels to the set, when he goes to the movie, he watches the credits. Because what's he looking for? His name. His name. That's a form of applause. That is a form of applause. Wow, I got recognized because I got the bagels to the set on time. Yes. What we're going to see here in this last story is some of the necessity for that. David's going to learn that and do it well. So let's get into it. Um, <coughs> I'm going to do a very quick run through. Let me get that. I'm going to do a very quick run through because we're going to be in chapter 30, but we have to briefly blow through chapters 27, 28, and 29 to get there. So I'm going to give you a, a very brief overview of those to get us to today's story. In chapter 27, David's living with the Philistines. Now this comes right on the heel of Saul saying, you're blessed and heading back to Gibeah, heading back to his castle. And David says to himself, self, you know, we're going to keep doing this dance with Saul where Saul goes back, he says, I'm cool. Then somebody talks to him. He comes back out to kill me. He said, and eventually Saul's going to get me. You know, we only can play this game so many times before <coughs> statistically Saul's going to win. He's been betrayed by his own tribe for a second time. His own relatives, his own people have betrayed him. So he says, I'm going to go hang out with the Philistines. And he goes to Ashish. He's one of the kings. Now, the, the way the Philistines ran their, their society, they were a people group, but they had several, for lack of a better term, kings. They had several kind of regional rulers that would all get together, and then they would fight as a group. And Ashish is the king in a city by the name of Gath, in the southern part of the Philistine territory. Why is Gath important? That's where the giants live. That's where Goliath came from. He goes to the home city of the guy he killed to start being the David that we all know. He goes to that city. Interesting choice, is it not? So he takes his 600 guys, their families, the whole kit and caboodle, and goes to Gath. The leader there says, yeah, but I'm not going to have you here. I'm going to put you in one of my lesser, smaller cities, and you can go live there. So take your folks and go live there in our territory, and we'll kind of see. So Ashish is not com a complete idiot. Well, this is David. <laughs> and as God said, they save all of the people, 100% of them. Not, it says, from the greatest to the least, not some... Suckling child, one of the one of his men who had a, a newborn baby just before they left, and he was hurrying back to go see his his new son or daughter, who was oh now gone. The city's burned. My brand new child. God said all of them. 
100% of them were saved. That would have included the Philistines who were still living in Ziklag. God saved them all. And as a result, David was given the sheep and the cattle as his share as they headed back to rest where the rest of his men were. Now, by this point, <clears throat> if you haven't been tailing along real well, David is now becoming a wealthy man. Remember, he married who? Abigail. Abigail, whose husband was? And rich. And wealthy. So he now has all of that under his control. And now he has all of the sheep and the cattle, and that in that culture is wealth. That's money. When I worked with the lost boys, and I still have a ceramic cow proudly displayed on my bookshelf that they made, because that was what they did. They, they raised cattle. And in remembering their homeland, they would make these ceramic cows and sell them to help make money for their center and whatnot. But that was, that was their sign of wealth. The more cattle you had, the richer a person. David has now become a wealthy man. And he's not even yet king. But the Amalekites have been wiped out. God's not done with them yet. Like I said, we're going to see David deal with them later as king. And he's going to finally finish them off after the... Um, Cyrus is king, Naaman, that whole story, and the last of them will finally be dealt with. See, when God makes a promise, when God said he's going to deal with something, it gets done. <laughs> it never not gets done. It gets done. It may not get done in the time frame that we're interested in, but it gets done. Amen. So now we're going to have a little secondary problem. And this is where that whole applause thing comes in that we started with. To share or not to share? Sounds a little um, Shakespearean, does it not? Uh, verses 21 to 31. Now David came to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David, whom they also had made to stay at the brook <coughs> Bessor. So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered and said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. But David said, My brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us who has preserved, preserved us and delivered into our hand the truth that came against us. For who will heed you in this manner? But as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. So it was from that day forward he made it a statute, an ordinance for Israel to this day. Now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, Here's a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord, to those who were in Bethel, those who were in Ramoth of the south, those who were in Jatir, those who were in Aror, those who were in Simphoth, those who were in Eshtemoah, those who were in Rakal, those who were in the cities of the Jeremites, those who were in the cities of the Kenites, those who were in Horam, those who were in Korshan, those who were in Athlech, those who were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to rove. All right, a round of applause for that one. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of names that you're going, oh, how do I pronounce that real quick? Excellent job. <laughs> That's my school teacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent job. And that's sometimes that's the fun stuff of reading the Bible. You're going, uh, how do I pronounce that? <laughs> um, we will fix that one. 
that. Yeah, I'm just, um, okay, there's too many vowels and not enough consonants. Um, anyway, David comes marching back. He still has his men. He has wiped out an army far bigger than his because the remnant that leaves is the size of his army. We don't know how big they were, but if just the remnant that leaves is the size of his army, you can let your imagination go. And these, there were hundreds that they took out. He happily greets the men who'd been left behind. David walks up and says, guys, <laughs> we're back. And look, we wives, children, and look at all these cows and sheep. And look at all this gold and stuff that we've got. We've got it all. That's my kind of lead. Yeah, that's in the Bible. <laughs> that's in my mind's eye. When I see that, that I'm... But if you remember when David was forming his army, who first came to him? Who's his army made up of? All the rejects. All the rejects and the uh, people who don't play so nice with others make up a big part of his army. And some of them now are showing their attitude once again. Now remember just a couple of days before, what were they wanting to do with David? Stoning. Stoning. And David has led them to another, yet another under God's hand, amazing victory. And David comes back and he's saying, hey brothers, we got this, this is so cool. And some of his ragtag, ne'er-do-well knuckleheads are saying, uh-uh, uh-uh. We're not sharing with them. They can have their wives and daughter, their kids back. That's it. And then they got to take off. We don't want anything to do with it. But David reminds them of who gave them their victory. He said, Guys, remember I had Abiathar the priest come and bring the ephod and I prayed before God and I got the Urim and the Thummim out and we talked to God and God said, go get him and you're going to rescue all the people and you're going to be wildly successful. Why did we win? God gave us the victory. So why are you busy going to be messing with your fellow guys who have been with us for years? They have fought other battles with us. And he says this, the share of the one who goes into battle is to be the same as the share of the one who remains with the supplies. See, David realized that while they hadn't been involved in the fighting, that it was of equally vital importance that a trusted force had to remain back with the supplies so that they had something to come back to. Because what was left in Ziklag? Nothing. Nothing. And David, when he was going out, he didn't know. David, God said, you're going to rescue the people. But God didn't say, I'm also going to give you all kinds of supplies and food. Now that they end up getting that. So David had left those 200, one-third of his fourth, with the supplies that they had, their marching food, their marching water, had left them that so that his army had something to come back to. And he said, here's the way it's going to go down, yo. <laughs> from now on, and it says in Scripture that David made this an ordinance for Israel from that time forward that they all would share equally. <clears throat> the guys who were sitting back, guarding the supplies, would get their names in the credit at the end of the movie. The guy who brought the bagels to the set would get his name in the movie. He said, they get a round of applause. They kept our stuff. And that became an ordinance for Israel from that time forward. See, what David realized was that everybody was important to the mission. 
not just the upfront people. But who generally gets the applause in our society? It's the upfront people. But I will tell you right now, having been both a background person and an upfront person, as an upfront person, you can't do your job effectively if the background people aren't doing their stuff. It become, your job becomes impossible. And David realized it. When they get back to Ziklag then, and as she read in all that wonderful laundry list of names that none of you will ever remember until the next time you happen to read 1 Samuel, David sends gifts to the leaders of most of the rest of the, most of those names are the tribe of Judah. What name, what city did you not see mentioned? Ziph and the Ziphites. David doesn't send them a little gift. But he sends all the places, and when again, if you study a map, you'll see that this is a lot of the areas where David had been wandering, trying to avoid Saul, and these were kind of the leaders of that, and David is sending them all thank you gifts. Hey, I now have stuff back, and I'm going back to thank the little people. David is essentially giving a round of applause to all of these other members of the tribe of Judah that had kept him safe and helped his men back in those early days. And that is how you make friends. Yes. <laughs> because you remember what people have done for you. It's also speculated that at this point he did not know that Saul was dead. You'll read, we're not, and we're not going to read that. That's the next chapter, chapter 31. But historically, this has probably happened about the same time that David is dealing with the Amalekites. So even though it's chapter 31 and follows chapter 30, chronologically in time, the Philistines, remember they had gathered, they had sent David off. It's been three, four, five days now. And this big battle that's going to happen where Samuel's ghost, <laughs> I hate to say ghost, Samuel's spirit tells Saul, you and your sons are going to be killed, has already happened. So David hasn't figured out that Saul is now gone. This brings the story of David to a close in 1 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, that, and I, I'm not sure when we will go there, we will pick David back up again sometime in the future, and we'll see him as king. This is what happens in 2 Samuel. So we've taken David from a boy of... 14, 15, now to a man leading an army, listening to God. Has he made screw-ups? Yes. Majorly. But what have you seen David do every, every single time that he screws up? He returns to the Lord, and thus his title of a man after God's own heart. Because David is not perfect. He's not even close. And when he's king, he really screws up. That's when he, he gets into murder and adultery. <laughs> but he always returns to God. He doesn't sit there and wallow in his sin. He has incredible love. Yes, and respect for God. And he's willing to listen. Remember, he listened to what is his now wife, before she was his wife, when he was going to go wipe out her husband and... And she runs out to him and says, um, I don't know if you want to do this. And he had not consulted God then. But this time, he has consulted God. Also, we don't see him consulting God before he goes off to fight with the Philistines. He just marches up and he's in there in the parade. He's never talked to God. But now, he, t you know, he talks to God. He distributes all this wealth that was his. To people along the way that's helping him get there. He doesn't forget or assume he got there on his own. Yes, and he, he's done exactly that. He's gone back and said thank you to all of those people that have made him or helped him become who he is. So let's look at some applications here real quick. I have three of them. He does a number of things really well here in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel. The first off is when disaster strikes, 
he finds strength in his relationship with God. What does that presuppose? What did he have that he could go find strength in already? See, he didn't form the relationship when the disaster hit. He had the relationship already, and that's where he found his strength. The Bible says, in this world you will have trouble. Which means I have to have that, I, I should have that relationship going already, because that's where I can run to find strength. And when you read through the Psalms, and David is constantly saying, the Lord is my, my shield, he's my, my, my place of refuge, he's my fortress, that he's implying I already had a relationship. And when that disaster struck, that's where he went to go find his strength. Too many times we want to form a relationship with God when the disaster hits. <clears throat> when we walk into a situation that's horrible and catches us completely unaware, we often tend, though, to react like David's men. We want to blame somebody, we want to punish somebody for the fact that I'm having a problem. It's somebody else's fault. His men cry, they scream, they try to find someone to blame. And all too often that person is someone very close to us, is it not? Because that's the easy person to blame, is that person that's real close to us. But now, instead of finding an easy target to blame, David doesn't go like his men. He calmly and rationally thinks through the situation, trusting in God. He says, oh, I know what I need to do. I need to get on my knees before God and start praying and asking God what I should do. And we don't even see him blaming God for the situation. God, how could you possibly allow this to happen to me? <laughs> Because, after all, I am me. God, how, I'm your boy. How could you? He just says, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Should I do this? God said, yeah, that's your... But he has that relationship already set. Number two. Before he jumps in, I've already kind of alluded to this. Before he jumps into action, he talks to God. That's another thing that we want to do, isn't it? Come on, let's go. Let's do, let's do something. This comes out of his trust in God, and allowing, which allows him to think clearly. Now he can move in complete confidence. Because what did God tell him? Who was he going to rescue? Everybody. Everybody. He said, I'm going to rest. You're going to get them all, David. Every single one, from the least to the greatest. You're going to get them all. Man, all my years of coaching and playing ball, I would have loved to have known if I was going to win when I stepped onto the court. Now, as you may guess, I'm kind of an optimist. I never thought I was going to lose, but I did. <laughs> I went to the ball game last night of CBU against... Tennessee. Tennessee is the number three baseball team in the country. GCU. What did I say? CBU. CBU. Sorry. Wrong. I was there a week ago. GCU was playing baseball against Tennessee, the number three baseball team in the country. It was a tight game. And at the end, we won. Four to three. But it was, they have the number two pitching staff in the country. In, in college level baseball and for a while there we were down and came from behind and won the game but I tell you what when they walked onto that field knowing you I'm going up against the number two pitching staff in the entire country <laughs> it would have been great to have known when you stepped onto that field get ready to throw your first pitch yeah at the end of this game we're going to win four to three so okay let's go that's what David went into a battle. God said, you're getting them all. He talks to God, but it comes out of point one, out of his relationship. And point three, and here comes the applause. 
He treats all of his people fairly. All of them. Including the guys who just hung back and guarded the food and the water so that the people had something to come back to. Absolutely. He recognized the importance of the role that those who stayed behind played. He knew that going forward, that getting people to fill... He knew that if I'm going to be king and I'm going to need people to do these menial jobs, these little tasks, if I'm going to get somebody to do that, what do I have to do? I got to treat them fairly. I got to go, nice job, excellent, that was great. Man, I came back and here's all of our food and water, exactly, so that now we can come in and have something to eat and drink. This, this is great. Do we need to do that, Levine Baptist Church, as a church body? Yes. Are there men and women doing little task, air quotes, around here all the time? Yes. When was the last time you gave them a round of applause? When was the last time you came up and patted them on the back and said, man, that's, thanks for blowing off all the leaves so that this place looks sharp when we come walking in here on a Sunday morning? Thanks for doing it. David says, he said, and from now on, my entire army and my country is going to operate in this fashion. He knew that it would be really difficult to get people to do those if they're not being recognized, if their name is not getting up on the screen at the end of the movie. He realized that all of the, all of the positions in the church were of a vital importance to the church moving forward as a single mass. These are the three things that we need to learn out of 1 Samuel chapter 30 as a people and as a church. We need to have that relationship as individuals with God. We need to have that relationship as a church with God because when the tough times happen, that's where we go to get our strength. And then we go right into number two and we start talking to God. And then when it's all done, and we are victorious because God is 100% victorious every time. And Levine Baptist Church, when we do these two, we also will be victorious. And Levine Baptist Church will continue to spread the word. And people will continue to be baptized. People will continue to come to, to faith in God because we have done points one and two. Then we turn around and we make sure that everybody, everybody in this church who has a vital role, and who does not have a vital role in this church? <clears throat> Nobody. Because everybody here has different gifts, no matter your age. And I've got, I've, there's an age difference in here. Yeah. <laughs> and all of us have those things that make us important as an entire body for victory for the name of Christ here. That's the lesson we get from David. And we need to make sure that everybody gets that. Amen? Amen? Steve, would you close us? Gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank the Lord for this lesson, Father. Lord, thank you, Lord, for showing us, Father, that there's no, no one above anybody else, Lord, in this family. That we all strive for the same thing. So, Father, with that, I pray that you go out, Father, and that... Uh, We'll spread, spread your love, Father, your, your word to the neighbor, our neighbors around us, Father, that you may be exalted because hopefully, for ultimately, Father, that's the goal, Lord, that, that, uh, that you will become the Lord and King of our lives, Father, and our neighbors' lives. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for Harry. We thank you for the time that, uh, and the times he spends in preparing his lessons and the way he prepares them, Lord. They're so easy that to, uh, uh, understand and, and to learn from. We thank you for, uh, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for uh, the men of the church that stepping up, Father, in the uh, times that will be coming up. Lord, may we be notice, noticing that, Father, and not so much patting them on the back, 
tell him thank you. Keep you, Lord, with that. We give you the praise. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen.